So it's my thank you all for coming. Good afternoon, or if you're in the Seattle time zone. But today, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Aishwarya Ganesan from uh, VMware Research. Uh, Aishwarya, she graduated from UW Madison uh, a couple of years ago, where, and along the way, won a bunch of best paper awards. She works in the area of um, distributed systems, uh, the intersection of distributed systems and storage. And uh, for the last couple of years, I think she's been a postdoctoral researcher at, BM, uh, at BMware. Uh, that said, um, take it away, Ashwarya. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. I'm very excited to be here and uh, present my work today. So today I'll be talking about my work on consistency and performance in distributed storage system. Usually one might have to choose one of these two things. And in this talk, I'll show how we can achieve both these guarantees. We rely upon modern online services in our day-to-day -day lives for many purposes, including social networking, e-commerce, video streaming, finance, ride sharing, et cetera. Most, if not all of these applications store their data on distributed storage systems. So these distributed storage systems in some sense form the core of all the services that run in today's data centers. And these systems must meet some important goals. So what are some of the goals? First, the storage system must present a meaningful view of the data it stores to the applications that are accessing them. That is the storage system must provide strong consistency guarantees. Second, applications expect that the storage system is going to keep its data safe, even in the presence of hardware or software failures. Finally, the storage system must provide efficient access to the data it stores whenever applications access the data. Unfortunately, the goals that relate to guarantees, such as consistency and reliability, are often at odds with performance in distributed storage systems. So a system that provides strong consistency and reliability guarantees might not perform that well. In contrast, a system that provides very good performance might only offer weaker consistency and reliability guarantees. In this talk, I'll focus on the trade-off between consistency and performance. To talk about this trade-off, let's see how data is stored in a distributed storage system. So in a distributed storage system, you don't just store the piece of data on a single machine. Why is that case? That's because if this machine were to crash, you would lose access to your data. So usually you store the data redundantly on many machines. Now, even if one of these machines were to fail, you will still have access to your data. But this inherent mechanism of replicating data creates a tension between consistency and performance. So even when the data is replicated and stored across multiple servers, the ideal and correct behavior we want the system to provide is that it should act like a single copy. That is, it should provide this illusion that there is only one copy in the system. And this is what a strongly consistent system provides. And this is a strong guarantee because it hides the fact that multiple copies exist, thereby making it easier for us to reason about the system behavior because the system is going to hide any inconsistencies that would arise because of multiple replicas. And thus it also eases programming. But unfortunately, these systems tend to not perform that well. In contrast, a system might not behave correctly and provide the single copy illusion, but expose inconsistencies to applications. For example, consider this uh, system that's storing some piece of information related to some social networking post and an application is querying the system as of how many people like the particular post. To this, the system could give out the correct answer or it could give out a wrong answer or it could first give the correct answer and then go back and then querying again, give a wrong answer. These are all inconsistencies that this weak system is exposing. And so the system is providing weaker consistency guarantees to applications. So these inconsistencies might result in a frustrated end user like this uh, Reddit user who is frustrated that their like count is incorrect, which is not a very serious issue. 
But in many cases, though, it can also lead to serious issues like the one shown here, where some bitcoins were lost because this application was built atop a system that provided eventual consistency guarantees, which is a weak guarantee. It is hard for us to reason about such a storage system. And so it is also difficult to program applications on top of such a system. But the upside with these systems is that they tend to perform very well. So to most distributed storage systems today then make a trade-off between consistency and performance, and they fall into one of these two worlds on how they trade off between these two properties. So first, there are some systems that favor consistency over performance. And second, there are some systems that favor performance over consistency by default. And my work focuses on resolving this tension between consistency and performance. And my approach to addressing this trade-off between consistency and performance is to focus on what is externally visible to clients and defer any expensive work the system has to do until the state is externalized. So what do I mean by this? So my approach is to defer the work that's required to keep the system consistent and make, move it from the critical path of updates. And this helps us in achieving high performance. However, because we defer some work, the storage system can be in an inconsistent state, but this inconsistency is only internal to the system and not exposed to the outside world. And my approach ensures that whenever external entities interact with the system, all the required constraints are enforced and the work that we defer is completed before the state is externalized. And this helps us in achieving strong consistency. So that is my high level approach. And remember that we talked about these two worlds. My work uses the approach that I just described to build solutions that improve both these classes of systems. So for the first class of systems, I propose new solutions to improve the performance of these systems. And for the second class of systems, I propose new solutions to improve the consistency of these systems. And these solutions are not enabled because of hardware advancements or implementation techniques, but rather they are enabled by fundamental opportunities I identify and how I rethink some of the most fundamental things in distributed storage systems. In particular, in the first world, I explore a fundamental opportunity that lies within, not within the implementation of the system, rather at the interface to the distributed system. In particular, I identify a new interface level property that is prevalent in today's storage systems that enables us to defer work, which I call nil externality. And I exploit this property to build a new replication protocol. In the second world, I rethink how durability is achieved in a distributed system. In particular, I propose a new durability primitive that I call re-trigger durability. And this new durability primitive enables us to construct stronger consistency models atop it with high performance. In summary, one of the most important contributions of my research is this. I find new fundamental insights into decades old problems in distributed storage systems. So that is one contribution. The second most important contribution is that as a systems researcher, I take these fundamental problems fun and fundamental insights and build real systems where I implement these ideas and evaluate the benefits of these new approaches. So in particular, I build Skiros, uh, which exploits nil, the property of nil externality to improve the performance of strongly consistent systems to a huge extent. Similarly, I build two practical systems where I implement the re-trigger durability primitive and show that these systems achieve better guarantees with little or no performance overhead compared to a weakly consistent system. So in my talk, I'm going to focus on both these pieces of work. Apart from the work on consistency and performance, I've also made other research contributions. Specifically, I've built systems that provide better reliability guarantees without affecting performance. I have built tools to expose reliability problems in popular distributed systems and cluster management controllers. I've also worked on building performant local storage systems that use machine learning components or 
leverage emerging technologies like non-volatile memory. In this talk, I, I'll focus on my work on consistency and performance. And that was the introduction to the talk. And here is the outline for the rest of my talk. I'll first talk about null extended replication. I'll be spending most of my time on this work. And towards the end, I'll briefly talk about the other piece of work that I did. So let's start with a background on strongly consistent storage system. So before we look into how strongly consistent storage systems are built, let's take a look into the guarantees a strongly consistent system would provide to clients and applications that are accessing the system. So let's say we have a storage system and then we have two clients interacting with the storage system. Uh, let's say the first client issues a write and the second client tries to read the piece of data that the first client is updating. This read can see the either the initial value or the updated value. Let's say the write completes and the client second client issues another read. Now this read should see the updated value of the write that the first client did. That's because strong, in, in a strongly consistent system, these systems respect what's called the real-time ordering of operations, where let's say if you have one operation that completes and another operation starts, the second operation would be ordered after the first operation, as a result of which reads in these systems always return the latest data. Now let's consider this scenario where you have two concurrent operations trying to modify the state of storage system. And let's say both these operations complete and the first client issues a read. Now this client can either see three, the first, either of these values uh, that was done by these clients. Let's say the client sees three. Now, if the second client issues a read, it should also see three. That's because even though concurrent operations can be ordered by in, an, any, in any manner by a strongly consistent system, once we have established an ordering, then that ordering should remain the same. So that's the guarantee that we need to provide. Now, how do we go about building a system that provides this guarantee? So in a distributed system, you don't have just one copy of your data, you have multiple copies, and each of these copies is referred to as a replica. And the key idea to ensuring strong consistency is to use this paradigm called state machine replication. So where all the replicas start with the same initial state and then they execute the same operations in the same order, thereby producing the same outputs. And now if you ensure that this ordering respects the real time in uh, order in which the app operations were issued, then we can ensure strong consistency. So here, if all the replicas start with the same initial state and apply the same sequence of operations in real time, you can end up producing the same outputs. Now, how do we ensure that all the replicas execute on the same sequence of operations? That is the job of a consensus or a replication protocol. So you might have heard of many of these protocols like Paxos, Raft, or Viewstrap replication. These protocols ensure that all the replicas execute the same sequence of operations in real-time order. Now let's take a closer look at these protocols. So in, in these systems, each replica has something called a log apart from the storage system state it's happy, it has. And this log is where these replicas are going to store incoming client requests. And one of these replicas is usually designated to be the leader and the other replicas are the followers. Let's say you want to apply some updates to these stores and the clients first would send these updates to the leader, the leader then assigns an order for these updates and replicate these operations in order to the followers. A follower would add these operations to their log and then acknowledge the leader. Once a majority of nodes have added these operations to their logs, these operations won't be lost by the system and it would be durable. Now, even if one of these replicas were to fail, the system would still ensure that it's keeping the data safe. So these systems typically can tolerate up to F failures if you have two F plus one replicas. So here in this example, if you have three replicas, then the system can tolerate up to one failure. Now we've also agreed upon the order in which we are going to apply these requests. So the ordering has also been agreed upon and it's, the ordering won't change after this point. So the replic, the leader can execute these requests and return the responses to the clients. 
So from the time the client sends a request to the time the client receives a response, it incurs two network round trips and also persisting these updates onto the storage medium on each of these nodes. Thus, achieving strong consistency is expensive because it incurs these two steps. With faster storage devices, the cost of persistence is getting alleviated. But multiple network round trips can still hamper system performance. And this cost is especially high in settings like the wide area. So what do we do about this high cost? Our first idea here is to separate durability from ordering. So we need durability. Without durability, data can be lost and we cannot get strong consistency. But to achieve durability, you don't need to coordinate among replicas. So the clients can send the request directly to the replicas. And once you have made multiple copies of these requests, the system won't lose the data. So you have achieved durability in a single round trip, but we have not yet achieved ordering. So even if one of these replicas were to fail, the system would not lose this data. So we have achieved durability. But how about ordering? Ordering is expensive still, because to agree upon an ordering, we need to coordinate among the replicas, which would incur two network round trips. So how can we reduce this ordering cost? Of course, we can focus on some techniques at the implementation level where we focus on how we can optimize the communication between two nodes or using some techniques like kernel bypass at each of the replicas. But in, instead in my work, I ask, are there some fundamental opportunities that is that are latent in today's storage interfaces, which we can leverage to avoid ordering in the first place. So that is the question that I ask. So now I'll talk about storage interfaces and the externality. So in my work, uh, I look at the interface the storage system exposes to the outside world. That's because well-defined interfaces often lead to desirable properties. For example, an interface that is item potent helps us in building a system that simplifies failure recovery. Similarly, an interface that is commutative helps us to build scalable software implementations. And these are some properties of interfaces that others have exploited in different contexts or to building different systems. In a similar spirit, I ask, what are some of the interface properties in today's storage system that would allow us to have high performance? So in this exercise, in my work, I identify a new opportunity in today's storage interfaces, which is which I call this property of nil externality. So a nil externalizing or a nil interface in short is an updated interface. And this interface can modify the state of the storage system in any way. So let's say you have a storage system, this interface can modify the state of the storage system in any way. The operation can be a blind overwrite or it could even be a read modify write. But this interface does not externalize the storage system state to the outside world immediately. That is, it does not externalize the effects of the operation by either returning an execution result or an execution error. The interface can still return an acknowledgement indicating the completion of a request. And my insight is that whenever an interface is nil x, a system can be lazy about doing some work. Specifically, you can defer executing a nil x operation, and this would lead to better performance. So that is a high level intuition. And before I talk about how I exploit this intuition in the context of replication protocols, I'll give you examples of nil x and non nil x interfaces and talk a bit more about these interfaces. Let's consider an example of a nil x interface. So the put interface and the key value API is an example of a nil x interface. So put in the key value API does not return an execution error. For example, if you are trying to insert something, if even if, if the key that you're trying to insert is already present, even if that's the case, the put API does not return an execution error. Similarly, put does not return an execution result. It just simply returns an acknowledgement. So this put interface is an example of an LX interface. Now let's consider some non-LX interfaces. Any interface that returns an execution result. For example, if you have a read modify right where that returns the current value of the storage system, uh, that would be a non-LX interface. 
So here, this increment is an on-index interface. Similarly, anything that returns an execution error is also a non-index interface. So I told you that there, could, there are some benefits for having Nelex interfaces in terms of performance. So how common are these Nelex interfaces? Is it practical for us to have Nelex interfaces in systems? So it turns out these, that these Nelex interfaces are very prevalent in many storage systems today. So if you look at the API for popular key value storage systems like RocksDB, LevelDB, and SplitterDB, Nilix interfaces are quite prevalent in the API of these systems. Almost all updates in these popular key value stores are Nilix. So here, uh, the put, as I told you, does not return an execution error if the key that you're trying to put is already present. Even deletes are Nilix because a delete does not return an error if the key that you're trying to delete is absent. Even read modifier rates are Nilix in these systems. So a read modifier rate in these systems are implemented as something called a merge operator and merge operators do not return an execution error or an execution result. So these Nilex interfaces are prevalent in some APIs. There are also some APIs that have a mix of Nilex and non-Nilex interfaces, which is the case of memcached here. But production traces reveal that updates, most updates that are issued by applications are Nilex. And we see this from production traces at, of memcached at Twitter and also IBM's cloud object storage. So to recall, the problem that I initially said was that achieving strong consistency requires us to establish ordering, which is expensive and incurs two network round trips. And my key insight is that I realized that in today's storage systems, many their interfaces do not expose state. So many of the update interfaces do not expose state. And whenever an interface is nilexed, we can be lazy about when we establish ordering and execution. And that would help us in achieving one round trip nilex updates. And we can do this without affecting consistency because of the nature of the nilex interface. That's my high level idea. Now I'll talk about how we exploit this high level idea in the context of replication protocols. So as I already told you, we need durability, but you can achieve durability without coordination. So the clients can send the requests directly to the replicas and can achieve durability, but these requests have not yet been ordered. And now if the update interface is Nilex, and that is, it, it does not externalize the state of the storage system to the outside world, we can defer ordering and executing these Nilex updates. So the, but, so the, uh, replicas can acknowledge the clients and complete the Nelex update in one round trip with, at low latency. Later though, non-Nelex operations can externalize this effects of prior Nelex operations. For example, let's say if you have a, piece, a read to a piece of data item that was modified by a prior Nelex operation, then you need to ensure that all the replicas execute the same sequence of operations in real-time order and before we can externalize the effect of this uh, operation. So before we can return the results of uh, the read, we need to ensure that we enforce all the ordering and execution that we defer. And this helps us in achieving strong consistency. But this is not detrimental to performance because our system keeps ordering the requests and executing them in the background. So by the time a non nilex operation that exposes its state arrives, in most cases, we have already established the ordering and we have already executed these requests. So for example, here, the, we can return the result of the read quickly. So this new idea helps us in building systems that are performant and strongly consistent. Specifically, because we avoid coordination of the critical path of requests, we are able to up, uh, perform updates with low latency. And whenever we defer the work, we can batch all the work that we have done, deferred, and perform, do that work in a single batch, where we can batch this ordering across multiple requests, leading to high throughput. And this approach also helps us in achieving strong consistency, because although we might have some inconsistency, because we have not yet ordered, the inconsistency is internal to the system and is not exposed because of the nature of the NLX interface. And 
because we ensure that everything is enforced before state is externalized, we can ensure strong persistence. So that is my high level approach. Now, how does this approach compare with all the other approaches that address the cost of strong consistency in distributed storage systems? There are three classes of work that has happened. In one class of work, the ordering is pushed to the network, and that the network itself would order the request for you. And this has some nice properties in that it can provide strong consistency with, low with uh, high performance, but this requires special hardware and does not work when you have replicas distributed across data centers. Another approach is to use speculative execution where the replicas speculatively execute the request in the order that they arrive. But this approach can be expensive when there is a lot of concurrency and there is a high load on the system. And specifically, when there are a lot of speculations, uh, the system needs to roll back state on each of the replicas, which can affect the tail latency, the workload significantly. And it also increases the complexity of uh, the system because now the system has to have the code to deal with rolling back state. Another approach is to use commutativity, which is another interface level property. And the idea is that when two interfaces commute with each other, then the order in which you apply these interfaces do not matter. But this approach can be expensive when updated interfaces do not commute with each other. And all these approaches always eagerly order or execute requests. In contrast, my contribution is that I identify a new opportunity in today's storage interfaces, and I exploit this opportunity. That is, I exploit this property of null extensibility, which allows us to defer ordering and execution and thereby achieving low latency updates. And this approach has advantages compared to existing approaches in that it works for geo-replicated settings. We don't need any rollbacks. And our experiments show that we improve the tail latencies of workload compared to baselines. And more importantly, our approach combines well with commutativity. So our approach also has advantages over commutativity in that way, even when update interfaces do not commute, if they are nullized, we can have high performance. And we also can have a protocol that uses both these properties to even achieve more performance. So now I'll talk about the design of our system and then give some results. And I, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any at this point. I can ask a question. So I was kind of wondering about like the trade offs you're pointing out. So I was kind of wondering about like, um, so initially you had reliability as one of the things. So I kind of wonder like, has the window of vulnerability increased with respect to reliability now? Because you are, you know, you're kind of sinking in the background. So if some things were to fail now, or like, yeah, so I guess what are your views on like, has that trade off been made here or? Uh, yeah, that, uh, that's a great question. Uh, so uh, in our approach, we ensure that the durability of uh, requests is achieved by the time we acknowledge the request. So once you've acknowledged something, we ensure that those operations won't be lost. We just haven't agreed upon the order in which we would apply these requests. So we have just de deferred that work to the background. So even if there are failures, because we have not traded off durability, our system will ensure that these updates would be eventually applied and in the correct real time order. I see. I think Dan has a question. Yeah, pardon the, the naive question because I'm not familiar with the work. I certainly understand how a nil external operation like a put can be deferred and therefore effectively reordered with operations from other clients. But uh, how do, don't I need to maintain ordering with requests from the same client if, in case it's a put to the same value or if it's a read of that value? And, and, and where does that factor into this setup? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a great question. So uh, whenever we have uh, any two operations, like whether it could be from the same client or from the different client, if there is some real-time monitoring between these operations, then our system would ensure that these operations are applied in that real, uh, in order that respects the real-time order in which these requests were completed. So for example, let's say if you have two puts from the same client, one after the other, our system would ensure that these puts are applied in the same order uh, 
whenever it decides on the ordering. And whenever there is some operation that exposes state, for example, like a read operation, then we ensure that all the work that we defer is completed and we enforce consistency before the state is extended. So the read would see the effects of the prior puts that the client did in the correct order. So in, in some sense, the operations you're deferring if, if I'm going to defer a collection of operations, you know, more than one, right? Mm -hmm. uh, then, then you're checking that they're independent in some way, that there's no, uh, you know, what, what we might call a data dependence or an anti-dependence. Is that I should be assuming that? Is that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'll I'll be uh, talking about the exact protocol. So in our protocol, we assume that any operations to the same object, uh, if let's say there is a read that would expose the state of a particular object, then we would ensure that all the prior updates to that particular object is completed. Thanks. Thank you. So based on the insights I described, I designed uh, Skiros, which is a new replication protocol that exploits this property. And Skiros is leader-based, similar to other protocols. And Skiros gives the same guarantees. Uh, both in terms of availability and consistency as of these other protocols. So here's how Skiros processes different requests. So whenever there is a NILX update, clients send these NILX updates directly to all the replicas in the system. And a client in our system would wait for an acknowledgement from a super majority of nodes. And this should also include an acknowledgement from the current leader. So for example, if you were to operate on a system with five replicas, the client would wait for acknowledgements from four replicas and one of them would should be from the leader. So uh, this is slightly higher than the, ma uh, the majority requirement of uh, two round trip protocols like Paxos, but we complete this NILX updates in one round trip. So the client, uh, the client would just, uh, once it has received an acknowledgement from a super majority of replicas, the client would consider this NILX update to be complete. So in the background, the leader then establishes an ordering for these requests by coordinating with the followers. And it would do so for multiple such requests that we have deferred. And the leader would also execute these requests and ask the followers to do the same reads in our system go to the leader. If there are some pending updates to the object that's being read, then the leader would not return the result. So only if there are no pending writes to the object that uh, that's currently being read, the leader would return the result of the read quickly. So the leader checks for this. And if there are none, we would complete this read in one round drop. So this is the fast path for read. Reads sometimes though incur two round trips, specifically if a read accesses something to which there are some pending updates for which we have not yet agreed upon the order, then the leader synchronously orders the prior updates and then executes them before returning the response for the read. So this read incurs two network round trips and would take a slower path. And whenever there are updates that expose state, they take two round trips as well because we need to synchronously order and execute those updates. So we have both one and two round trip operations in the protocol, but the performance characteristic of our protocol in practice would be that the fast case would end up being the common case. That's because of two reasons. We already saw that NILX interfaces are very prevalent in many storage systems and frequently used by applications. Moreover, production traces also reveal that reads do not often access recent updates. For example, when analyzing traces from IBM uh, cloud object storage, we found that in 85% of the clusters, only less than 5% of reads were to objects that were modified recently. And we find similar trends in other popular cloud benchmarks as well. So a protocol that uses NILX analytics should perform well in practice. So I've explain to you the common case operations, the protocol and the performance characteristics. I'll now give you a brief intuition of why this protocol is correct in the common case. So one invariant that we maintain in Skiros 
is that the leader has all the completed updates in the correct real-time order. That's because we always wait for an acknowledgement from the leader to complete an LX request. Now, all the reads and non-LX updates go to the leader. So these operations would see the effects of other LX operations in the correct order. And thus giving strong consistency in the common case. Now, what if the current leader fails? So we need to elect a new leader. And when electing this new leader, we need to ensure that we recover all the updates that were completed. And we also need to recover the real-time order in which they were complete. So prior to the failure, the current leader had the correct updates in the correct order. But once there is a failure, the current leader is lost and we don't have access to the current leader. So how do we reconstruct this data on the new leader? And doing, when doing so, we need to ensure that any operations was completed is durable and the order in which they were completed is preserved. And if we have agreed upon an ordering for some operations, then we need to ensure that the ordering remains. And that's one of the key reasons why we need a supermajority. So I'll now give you an intuition on why we need a supermajority. So let's say we have considered this example where we have two operations such that one operation completed and then another operation starts. So this operation precedes this operation in the real-time ordering. And let's consider the case where we have five replicas. So the system can tolerate up to F failures. That is two failures. And Majority F plus one is three, and the super majority here is four. Let's consider the scenario where we have these five replicas, where S1 is the leader, and the client completes A, committing on a super majority, including the current leader, and then completes B, committing on a super majority, including the current leader. Now let's consider another scenario where the client completes on a super majority this operation, including the leader, and then completes B on a super majority. But note that there is some difference between these two scenarios in that in the second scenario, S4 does not have P where and S5 does not have A and these two do not know the correct ordering of the records. Now let's say these two nodes, S1 and S2 were to fail. So we have now lost the current leader. We need to elect a new leader and construct the order. And the system must still be available because even though we have lost two nodes, there are still three nodes that are up. So we need to maintain the availability of the system. So we need to make progress. So we need to ensure that we elect a new leader, get the data on the new leader and make progress. How do we do that? So we are going to use the remaining the, uh, data from these three nodes to construct the re real time ordering of operations. So first we need to recover the operations that are completed. So we can recover these two completed operations because they are present on these nodes. So we let's say we recover these two operations, right? Because they are present on these nodes. Now the goal is to recover the ordering between these operations. So the intuition is that if there is a real-time ordering between two operations, then among the F plus one nodes that are available, a majority among this F plus one would have the ordering A before B in their local state. That is, let's say you have three nodes uh, that are, that is F plus one is three. And if you go to two nodes in the system, you would be, a, these two nodes would say the correct ordering. So based on these two nodes, you can recover the ordering. So in this case, scenario one, S3 and S4 would say that from looking at the logs on these two nodes, we can recover the ordering A before B. But in the scenario two, while S3 has the order A before B, S4 does not really have that. But we can still consider that A is ordered before B in S4. That's because if the request B were to arrive at S4, it would be ordered after A. So we would still consider S4 to be A as ordered, A is added, ordered before B. So using this intuition, we can recover the ordering between A and B. And if two requests are concurrent, then we would not have the support, but we also don't need to recover the order. We can just assign some order uh, and use that as the new leader state uh, unordered requests and then proceed with that. 
So that's a high level intuition, but I won't get into the exact procedure in this talk, but rather I'll talk about some results. So we implement this protocol and build a key value store. We have the correctness proof in the paper, and we also run extensive benchmark to demonstrate the benefits of the approach. So what are the benefits of exploiting in externality? So to answer this, we compare skios against, yeah. Um, so the, um, so my understanding is if you get two failures, then you won't be able to have the super majority. And even after the leader gets reestablished, you won't have the super majority. And as a consequence, then all reads and writes would be slower in that world that you would have. So there is some trade-off that you're making. There's some assumption that you're making that, um, that at least in the common case, you're not in the kind of high failure case. That's fair? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. fair. You're correct. Right. So yeah, whenever there is um, no, no, so many number of failures that you don't have a super majority, then we would end up taking the slow path for the next updates as well. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So uh, to answer this question, we compare against uh, patch source for an index workload where we vary the number of clients and we plot the latencies against throughput. With patch source that does not employ any batching, it does not achieve high throughput, whereas compared to patch source without batching, Skeros improves the throughput significantly. Patch source with batching is able to improve the performance over patch source without batching. But these performance improvements in terms of throughput comes at the cost of latency. Specifically, Skeros can achieve this high throughput at much significantly lower latency than Paxos with patching. Now, what if there are some mixed workloads where you have a bunch of Nilex writes and reads? So to do this, we compare Skeros uh, and we use a YCSV, which is a benchmark for cloud storage systems. And we do this for different YCSV workloads that have different mixes of reads and writes. And we here plot the throughput. As you can see, when you have a workloads that are write heavy or write only, we have much higher benefits, significant benefits. Whenever you have a read heavy workload, the benefits in terms of performance in the perf throughput is marginal, but Skeros reduces the tail latency for such workloads significantly. Specifically, we noticed that Skeros reduces the P99 latency by 70% in read heavy workloads. And for all these cases, only 0.3% to 2% of operations take two round trips in Skeros. And this, is, this was true for all YCSP workloads. So to summarize this part of the talk, uh, strong consistency is expensive and incurs two round trips. And I, in my work, I propose a new replication protocol that provides strong consistency and incurs mostly one round trip. And I built a practical system where I implement this idea and show the benefits of this new approach. And my new contributions are that I identify this new property called externality that is prevalent in storage interfaces and design a replication protocol that exploits this property. By exploiting it, we are able to defer ordering and execution of Nilex request, which is different from all the other work that addresses the cost of strong consistency in storage, distributed storage systems. Sorry, there, before you switch gears, there's a question, uh, Simon. Yeah, yeah. Um, just uh, in the slide that you had on the YCSV workload, I wonder um, what is the read latency for Skiros in the 50-50 case where it's both write heavy and read heavy? Yeah, yeah. Um, so in that case, uh, uh, most read operations end up taking one round trip, uh, and about 2% uh, of the total number of operations take, end up taking two round trips, which is 4% uh, of uh, the 50% of reads end up taking two round trips because they access something that was recently updated. But if you plot the overall latency distribution of the overall workload, uh, you would still be performing much better than uh, the Paxos version because we are improving the performance for all the 50%, right? So although we pay some uh, overheads on some of the reads, but uh, since we improve the performance on a lot of writes, the overall gains in terms of operation uh, latencies is uh, much better for Skeros. I see, that's that's interesting because I would have, that's exactly what I was after. It, it seems to me that you're also making a trade-off here that you trade, um, Retail latency for better 
write latency. Um, like in, in a Paxos protocol, my write latency would often be two round trips, but uh, I can basically have a read for one round trip. And here, if I read something that was most recently written, I might incur two round trips for the, for the read. And I would have expected that uh, unless my understanding of the YCSB workload is wrong, that YCSB, unlike the workloads, the IBM workload that you presented earlier, would actually be one where because of the nature, the synthetic nature of the benchmark, um, it reads and writes, frequently reads and writes the same objects. And so uh, I would have expected that you would often incur two round trips for the reads because um, you read something that was also most recently written because they're both, the algorithm uses the same, uses the same objects because it uses the same random number generator for them. Yeah, yeah. So, um... Uh, we use the default YCSB workload with the Zipian distribution where some keys are popular and there are a lot of reads and writes to it. But um, what happens is that only on the first read we would uh, incur the slow path. And when we do that, we not only establish ordering for op operations that affect that read, we also do that for all the other pending things. So we end up saving, having to do this for other things. So although we increase the, and, and also in the background, we keep doing this work. So both right. of these things keep that number low. And then, so when we analyzed all the YCSB workloads, we find that uh, less, so, so the 2% was the sort of the worst case. So for like read heavy workloads, like YCSB, we, uh, 0.2% of operations ended up taking this low path. That's because there were not a lo lot of number of writes. So, they were not uh, reads were not taking right. this path for that, uh, and in the paper we also do uh, different micro benchmarks where we vary different percentages of reads going to the latest data data item, and then we show how the performance looks like for okay. these different scenarios. I see. So even in the fifty fifty case, there's enough time between writes and reads that you get to execute your work in the background, so that by the time I get to read something, even if it was most recently written you're likely already done doing your work. And so the read can, yeah. can, can, can finish within one round trip. Yeah, yeah. Okay, That's got it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, so um, now I'll briefly talk about uh, consistency of durability before I uh, talk about some of the future research directions. Um, so in many systems that currently use uh, weaker consistency guarantees, they adopt an eventual durability model for establishing durability of data. In that, whenever there is a write to the system, the data is just buffered in one node's memory and acknowledged immediately. And then later, the writes are made durable by replicating and persisting them on many nodes. And this the advantage is that you can do have fast writes, but the disadvantage is that whenever there is a data, uh, whenever there is a failure, you could end up losing data, which means that the system can expose inconsistencies. So in my work, I rethink this durability layer and rethink how we achieve durability to think about like, can we improve the consistency guarantees of these weak systems, but without affecting the high performance that they currently have. And my key idea here is to shift the point in which we achieve durability to reads from writes. So in particular, we did still delay durability on writes, so we get high performance, but before serving out reads, we guarantee that all the data that's, uh, that this read affects is made durable before the state is externalized. And this helps us in ensuring that anything that has been exposed by the system via reads are not lost and allows us to construct stronger consistency models on top of it. In particular, we allow, we uh, prevent out of order data across multiple failures and client sessions. So out of this new durability primitive, I built uh, cross-client monotonic reads, which allows us to construct in order reads across clients and across failures. And we can rely upon this property because the underlying durability layer ensures that things are durable before it is exposed by our reads. And I will uh, implement this idea in two systems, uh, Redis and uh, Zookeeper. And I experimentally show that compared to a system that provides weaker consistency guarantees, this is because of this new approach, we can improve the guarantees, but this comes at no or little overhead. 
specifically does not increase the cost of uh, the system. So now I'll talk about some of the future research directions quickly. So uh, in the future, I'd like to think about what are the context can we apply the idea of null externality? This is because usually we exploit these properties in many different contexts. So I would like to think about in what other context can null externality be exploited? And interactive client server applications are one such class of applications where uh, currently we often forgo fault tolerance for low latency. But here I would like to think about if interactive inputs expose state and can exploit null externality of these inputs. RDMA offers a way for us to communicate in data centers, but the traditional view is that RDMA primitive of one-sided operations is not suited for many scenarios. And here I believe there are applications of null externality. Those are some immediate projects. In the long term, I would like to think about how we can build distributed systems that adapt by using learned components to the environment, to the workload, and to the data distribution. For example, when replacing traditional indices with learned models, we are, by being aware of the data distribution, we can enable faster lookups in storage systems. And I've worked on this uh, in the past in applying this idea in the context of log structure merge trees. And in the future, and we have made a lot of progress in local databases and other contexts. In the future, I would like to think about what other opportunities exist in computer systems, and specifically, what mechanisms in distributed systems can we replace with, with machine learning models, or can machine learning models help improve these mechanisms? In the future, I would also like to explore how do we fundamentally rethink systems to leverage emerging technologies so that we can meet different application requirements. Specifically with emerging hardware like computational storage devices, we have this new capability in that we can offload compute to the IO device, but it's not clear how do we leverage this new hardware in different systems. So how do we rethink the way systems are built so that we can leverage this new hardware and extract the benefits. In addition to new hardware, there are also emerging architectures that require us to rethink how we build systems. Specifically, we have been running applications in the cloud and clients access their applications over long latency links. But with Edge, we have resources closer, available closer to clients. So here I would like to think about how we can use these resources to better support low latency interactive applications and process the data from IoT devices and sensors. And what are the system challenges that arise in this context? So how do we expose these storage and compute resources? And how do we help program the edge for applications? What are the storage systems at the edge look like? And how do we meet different application requirements and so on? So with that, I'll summarize my talk. So my work revisits fundamental problems with this novel insight on focusing on what is externally visible and I propose two new solutions to address the trade-off between consistency and performance. So with that, I'll conclude my talk and I'm happy to take more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we have uh, Dan up first. Yes, so um, a nice talk on a very difficult problem. Um, I'm um, still thinking about your uh, uh, um, um uh, system and, uh, and approach. So uh, as, as Simon said, you're essentially uh, trading off the performance of, of uh, uh, writes for the performance of, of reads, but your argument is that the, there are actually rare contentions, rare, rare cases when the reads are for recent writes. Uh, but as far as I know, the Yahoo benchmark has very low contention. Um, uh, they, there are few conflicts between the, the rights. I'm thinking in a more high contention work uh, benchmark, like the TPC um, uh, benchmark, for example. Uh, there you could, it could be the case that the, 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 since there are many rights to the same elements, uh, even um, computing the total order might, might incur additional delay. Uh, and if you also have reads on the same elements, that could uh, further delay uh, your request to reach. Do you have any thoughts about uh, higher contention workloads uh, and how they would affect your system? 
got it. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm not sure like how the contention would sort of uh, uh, compare against uh, both these uh, workloads specifically YCSB and TPCC, but uh, to uh, to the best of my knowledge, like in YCSB, uh, the workloads like YCSB A and YCSB F, which is write heavy, but at the same time the uh, also has a Zipkin distribution where some keys are very popular and more frequently accessed. And uh, that's where I've tested this, uh, my uh, system. And so um, while there are some keys that are popular and those reads end up taking more time, but one, when, as I mentioned, like the, there are two things that sort of keep this uh, count low. First, because of the background work that happens in the system to ensure that things are ordered, before it's accessed, uh, we can keep this count low. And we have to do this only on the first read that triggers this operation. So once we have, for the first read, once we have established the ordering, let's say if there is a second read to some other item that's conflicting. Uh, but if we had not ordered, it would conflict. But now because we have ordered on this first read, the second read would not conflict with, uh, and would be faster. And in the paper, we actually compare against what this would look like in a workload with low contention, which is not, uh, and that does not use Zipfian distribution. So we use two workload distributions. One is with low contention, another is Zipfian. And we show that compared to the Zipfian workload, we are even able to perform even better. So there, the contentions are even more lower. And we uh, compare these two scenarios for different read write percentages in the paper. Uh, but at the high level, uh, sort of experience for me from evaluating the systems with different workloads is that in most cases, we are able to do one round of treats. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Tong. Uh, hello, I have a question for your uh, protocol that uh, if uh, there is a network reordering happens and your leader fails, how to mm -hmm. uh, recover the, the order in this case? Got it. Uh, that's a great question. So, um, but um, so let's say uh, there is a network reordering, but the leader fails, right? Uh, so, if you recall, our client uh, would wait for acknowledgments from a super majority of rec uh, replicas before considering the request to be complete. So, if let's say there is a real time ordering between one operation and another, in that recall that we call the two operations are ordered in real time only if this operation completed and then this operation started, right? So if that is the case, then this operation would go, have gone on a super majority of nodes and only then we would have started this operation. So, and based on, uh, and let's say this completes on a super majority and even if the current leader fails, uh, we can recover the correct ordering between these two operations. Um, but let's uh, let's say if these two were concurrent operations and the, uh, but, the idea there is that for concurrent operations, we don't need to recover the order because we can order the concurrent operations in any way. But once we have established the order, the ordering should remain the same. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Tom. Uh, sure, I'm gonna follow up on Dan's question. Um, so is it is it right for me to believe that, you know, roughly speaking, the performance of the system in the contention case is similar to the batch system that you were comparing to earlier. So like, is it the, is the case that when we have contention, is it, does the behavior of the system like the bat, is it like the batch system or is it some other, is the performance some other characteristic? Got it. Like, uh, so we uh, created this uh, artificial sort of uh, micro benchmark where we vary the percentage of reads that was written recently. Specifically, we um, vary uh, the percentage of reads that would access something that was written in the past uh, batch of uh, requests, which we would be buffering in our system. And we vary this percentage from zero to 100%, where at the extreme, everything is accessing that was just written not just recently uh, but also in terms of time but just uh, in terms of how the system operates specifically it was just updated prior to the read so and we sure. do this for 50 percent rights and 50 percent reads and what we show is that in this worst case we just we match the performance of the batch system 
that does this uh, part in the sink. So, they, so they're okay. So, so, so roughly, part. yeah. So, roughly speaking, then it behaves like a patch system when there's contention, and then behaves like a a, a non batch system when there's not contention. Uh, there was sort of a rough you know, the rough guide to what's going on. That, that was really where my question was going. And so the second question I had sort of related to that was you, you gave some result on tail latency. And I just wanted to understand the relationship between queuing and the tail latency. So in, in particular, your systems had higher throughput than the other systems or like particularly than the non-batch system. So, so in general, if you drive towards high utilization, I would expect the tail latency of the of the regular Paxos system to be really, really terrible, just because it's queuing. You know, it has higher, it has lower total throughput. Therefore, its queues would go uh, dramatically up, and its tail latency would go up dramatically. So, is there is there a benefit relative to tail latency? Um, so maybe you could talk about where that benefit for tail latency is coming from, because you can sort of imagine, okay, in the case where I have mm -hmm. at least reasonably free, you know, 2% of my operations are going to end up looking like a batch system, then I'm going to get the tail latency sort of similar to the batch system. Um, and like, is that what, what I should expect of the tail latency or is there something else that I'm missing? here? Yeah. Uh, so, um, about your uh, uh, so particular use case of the particular uh, case of the tail latency, uh, so uh, the reason why we are able to improve the tail latency is, is because in the original system the tail later, tail is going to uh, consist with, especially when you have a mix of writes and reads, uh, the tail is going to comprise of writes. So specifically like. If you look at the 99th percentile and uh, 95th percentile uh, for a read heavy workload that has 5% writes, this part of the distribution is going to end, be comprised of a request that are write requests and incur two network workloads. Whereas, whereas for us, we improve the performance for this. And because this is a write uh, heavy, the, this, is, this, also, this is a read heavy workload, there is also not a lot of writes happening, which means the percentage of reads that's taking the slower path in our system is lower. So that by a combination of these two, we are able to improve the tail latencies for uh, these workloads. Okay. Thank you. I have a kind of slightly different curiosity. I kind of wondered like the extent to which the performance benefits you're getting could be just self-managed by the clients. So if I have like a, you know, um, just like a, a, a series of reads and writes, and I know that I don't need to wait for writes or something like that, and I should wait for, for a read. Can I just like have all of my puts in the background, um, like as an application, and then basically have my gets in the foreground or some such thing? And would I then be able to kind of, you know, get a similar performance without modifying the replication stuff and, and some of the other trade-offs, uh, suffering some of the other trade-offs that, uh, that come up? Or would I, would I lose something if I just took a client-oriented approach to this? Uh, that's a great question. So um, if I understand correctly, what the question is, can we sort of um, push this uh, uh, idea into the clients? Or like, for instance, um, can we have the clients do the work uh, of writes in the background, but just do the reads in the foreground? Mm -hmm. um, we, I think it depends upon uh, the guarantee that you want for a write. So here we want to ensure that we complete the write and then proceed to do some other work. And so that is the guarantee that we are sort of, uh, the client is expecting from the system. So let's say the client is performing a write and then performing another write, these two writes will be ordered by the system or if the client is performing a write and then another client is issuing the read, the, this, client, this client would be able to see the effects of the write. And if we don't have this, we are sort of, we have to forgo this. And basically we cannot expect any sort of guarantees with uh, these requests that are pushed to the background. Uh, I'm not sure if that sort of. Um, no, I think that answers partly. I guess the, the difficulty in managing it in the program is what happens if the write fails or the write gets lost. You would need extra client side logic to roll back a code that actually relies on at least the write succeeding. 
even if you don't care about the answer, you have control flow dependency on the right succeeding, or you may have that in some clients. And uh, and uh, the other thing that we cannot control is what happens across clients. So like, let's say this client sort of is, uh, is issuing something and it crashed and like, can we expect the other clients to have some dependency upon what the work that this client did? Uh, I think I think that's something would we might not have if we are pushing this work to the background. But yeah, I, I agree with the point that you're making, especially with respect to uh, failures. Uh, okay, I think uh, one last question, Simon, before we let you take a break. <laughs> okay, yes, that's it. <laughs> um, yeah, I would actually, just to follow up to uh, Ratul's question, I would imagine that if you were to push it off to the client, you wouldn't necessarily get the durability guarantees right away, right? Like what you're doing, as um, you're, um, you're modifying it on the uh, the server side because mm -hmm. you're giving us immediate durability of the um, of, of each request so if anything fails I will be able to recover but you're deferring the ordering um, while yeah. if I were to push it all off to the clients I would imagine that if I were to just defer my my puts entirely I would get neither I wouldn't get the ordering which I might not care about and that's the part that um, I think I could handle with some additional client logic um, but I also would not retain the durability so my rights would be basically entirely lost if if i were to fail on the on the client side and i, I think that's one difference between pushing it off entirely to the client yeah um, yeah and uh that that's uh yeah that's correct and, and also across the clients like we might have some ordering that client can do locally but then across the clients we we cannot if sort of uh, perform any ordering unless we talk to the system so, yeah. I, I had one one question, uh, slightly related actually, and maybe also related to the first Dan's question, Dan Grossman's question. Um, how difficult is it to determine whether my interface is nil externalizing? Um, so, for example, you you talked about how um, acknowledgments are fine, but what if my acknowledgments are defined, or if my clients take acknowledgments as this operation has occurred, and I know now that if I say x equals three and I wait for the acknowledgement and then I say x equals four, can I, can I rely uh, on the acknowledgement to indicate that my x equals four will definitely be executed after my x equals three, which to me is a, an external, like it's almost like a read. I will basically be able to rely on some, uh, th something to have happened in the, in the system which will have an impact on linearizability. I was wondering. Yeah. Yeah, 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 uh, that's a great question. So when we give this acknowledgement, we give this guarantee that anything, uh, so the operation would be ordered before anything that happens after this operation. So for example, in this case, we give this guarantee that uh, this operation would be ordered before the second output that the client does. And that exposes um, the, guarantee, the consistency guarantee of the system, but it does not necessarily expose the current state of the system. Specifically, let's say there were another concurrent put from other client that happened at the same time of this client, we don't know which of these two puts happened at the later time. So that is what we are sort of trying to um, right. explore. That, that would be for, for puts where I don't wait for the act, right? They're, they're concurrently occurring. Um, but if I were to say I'm the same client and I issue one put, I wait for the ACK and then I issue another put, can I take yeah. the ACK as an, an acknowledgement that the first put has actually fully executed and thus will be ordered in front of my second put? Yes, the, we can take as this as an acknowledgement that the first put would be ordered before the second put. Uh, and uh, so, but that does not expose the current state of the system. We, we're just giving out this guarantee that we are going to expect linear stability, but we are not ex necessarily exposing the internal state of the storage system to the clients. Okay. And let's thank the speaker. Great talk. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank great you talk. so great much. Talk. Thank you so much for all the great questions. I really enjoyed uh, thinking about the questions and answering them. Thank you so much for your time.